And if you have questions, throw them in the chat uh, for sure. And I think uh, at the end, we'll, if you do want to ask your question live, we are welcoming you to do that. So, and this just FYI is being recorded and will be broadcast on the community strategy podcast. So with that, thank you for starting the recording and uh, welcome all to the uh, live session of the community strategy podcast. We've got tons of amazing people in our room today. Uh, shout out to the fine calm here community members, uh, Ani, we've got Denise here. We got Christy, we've got Joanne and we got Missy. And uh, I, of course, Kalisa is our lovely podcast uh, co-host. And so, and then we have some joining new people here. We've got Lee, we've got Monica, we've got Sandy, we've got Mark. And so uh, just excited because this is uh, gonna be a great topic today we're talking about. I'm gonna pitch it over to uh, Kalisa for the intro. So you go for it. Thanks, Deb. Um, hello, and thank you all for joining the Community Strategy Podcast. I'm Kalisa and I'm so happy. We have a full house tonight. We have a lot of new faces, which is really exciting. Um, we gotta say hi to everyone, especially Monica, Eileen, um, and we're joined with Denise and Christy, Mark, Lee. Oh, it's so exciting. I love the letting everyone in. Of course, I am happy to introduce our incredible host, Deb Shell, creator of Find Calm here, as well as Carolyn Zick today. She's the host of, on Mighty Networks of the Bad Axe Biz Club and admits creatives of the Midwest. Today, she'll share her journey in building, launching, and growing her Mighty Networks, as well as how she helps community leaders market and promote their communities. She was on the mini wellness retreat too, so we got to see a little insight of her brilliance. So I'm excited to dive a little bit deeper today. So thank you all, and Deb, go ahead. Awesome, fantastic intro. Yeah, thank you. And Carolyn, let's start it up here. So uh, we have been uh, networking for quite a while. In fact, how did we met in person? Yeah, which is pretty nuts. Yeah, in Memphis, Tennessee, in March at mm -hmm. the Community Leaders Institute Expo and uh, had a great conversation there. Literally, I think I was like on my way out to uh, one of the uh, happy hours that the vendor was, was running that night. It was like the close of the conference. So like, I mean, the CLIX was like a really intimate group of people, which was neat. So like, you know, everybody had kind of like seen each other in passing or been in similar like sessions. I think I probably saw every person who was attending so we'd seen each other before but like had never talked and then the my co-founder of amidst and I were there together and we were on our way to drive our long drive back to Iowa like as we were walking out so was Deb passing and we stood for like 20 minutes and had like a really lovely chat and got connected that way yeah I feel like you were like are you that Deb shell person <laughs> Yeah. Well, we, we were just in a session together. We had just been in one, I think it was ESARS. He was talking yeah. about video and using video. Um, if you guys don't follow ESAR and Pablo, Deb was just on their podcast. It's awesome, but it's really, really interesting. Me as a content creator, <clears throat> I was really into their session. Deb asked a few great questions and mentioned that she had a podcast just for Mighty Networks hosts. And that's the platform that I build on. So I was like, oh, we should talk because you are well-versed in this area that I just dove into and have no idea what I'm doing. So that's how we connected. Yeah. I know. I just had to give the backstory on that because it's not a typical meet and greet story for my, uh, my last two years because most of it's all virtual, but Same. so yes. So, so psyched to have met you. I'm psyched that you were able to join us in June. Uh, she did a mindful marketing for everybody who missed that, uh, inside the fine come here community, there is an entire resource that, uh, shares with you about each section with a recording and a transcript. So if you want to check that out, it is available inside the Find Cobb Harry community, which is now free, just FYI to everyone. Uh, so you can feel free to join. Uh, Kalisa, if you would be an awesome person and pop in the uh, Find Cobb Harry link for anybody who is not a member, that would be great. Um, Carolyn, so tell us a little bit about your scoop. Like how did you get into this community building space? 
I mean, like my mom's in the audience. She'll she'll tell you that I've always been trying to make more people be in one place at once. <laughs> um, so many times where I've asked, oh, could just like one or two people come over? And then it's like 70 people later um, at our house. And she was always such a <laughs> good sport about those snowball type events. Um, community building has always been really important to me. I'm a really big extrovert. I'm married to a very big introvert. So I see the benefits on both sides of the like, you know, energy level or like how you're empowered by other people, whether it's, you know, on the more introverted side or extroverted side, like how community can benefit both. Um, mental health has always been really important to me. I may be getting totally ahead of it, but since, you know, I was a kid, it's always been really big to me to have people that I can rely on within my family, without my family for different things. So I have benefited from communities so much. I learned to crochet because of my family, which is something I'm really passionate about. And I learned to knit because I made a friend on the internet from Norway who taught me in the middle of the night on Skype back in 2011, what? how to knit. So that was really like, <laughs> for me, like I'm passionate about the fiber arts and love that outside of marketing. And People that was some... telling me I should get into knitting. And I'm like, uh, I, I can uh, teach you. I'm not my, I'm not my grandma. My grandmother didn't even knit, but I'm not my grandma. Hey, it's <laughs> super cool. It's very trendy right now, especially, hey. but anyways, that, you know, I've benefited so much from community. So even you know, like an online communities, I grew up, I'm a, a digital native, right? So like had internet at home from a young age, was online in chat rooms, meeting people from all over the world and just like cool stuff, right? That like having access to that is cool and having inroads to communities all over for all different niches is super cool. So I accidentally became a digital marketer in 2015. And then from that, I've helped a lot of different businesses across a lot of different industries show up online organically to the right people. And that really dovetails into what a community is because when you're building the way that I do for social like audiences I'm really focused on the relationships so when I work with a brand we're not talking about ad spend you can do that I don't hire somebody else to do that <laughs> but we're talking about you know what is your content doing? What is the point of being online? I'm a big proponent of if you have no goal for what your marketing is going to do, like get out, like throw your phone in a river. Con content for content's sake is not a thing anybody should do. And I feel like no. I've, I, I, I've been there, done that and have like the 15 t-shirts to prove that. Oh yeah. Is well, like we're all guilty, right? Like it's so easy to fall into the desire to make stuff just because you feel like it'll help you get ahead. And in like, you know, seven plus years of like teaching people how to market themselves effectively and in an organic way, it always comes back to the people. And that's what a community is. It always comes back to making sure you're in front of the right people and doing right by them. So what like we had discussed that we were gonna chat about today is using social media as an inroad to your community and how to do that in a way that's A, it works, and B, not detrimental to your mental health, right? Because I hate it when marketers suggest like post eight times a day. I'm like, why? <laughs> I'm sure we've all read some blog that's like the best way to grow on Instagram is three reels a day and 45 store, you know, like we've all seen that and like, sure, that's the best way to grow if you want to hate everything and be sad. Um, we all like our brains are our biggest assets and engaging in behaviors that detriment our brains. Like, no, thanks. Not for me. Not, not my, not my plan. Right? We, we have like a limited finite amount of energy. 
Yeah. And, yeah. and that's why it's like, I like when we talked about mindful marketing and how do you, you know, promote this idea of a community community concept and, and you have a community that you want to bring together people because you just love, you know, connecting with people, but then you also need to still have it as a business and yep. somehow have it return on investment. So how do these two things align? Right. Which is what yeah. I really love how you talk about. Yeah. So with that, like how they align and I've been doing this. So I launched Bad X Biz Club in January after sitting on the idea for almost a year and trying to figure out like, how does it look? How does it work? I've pivoted like four times since then. Right. So that's, you know, like it started as a paid community almost immediately. I was like, it just doesn't sit right with me. Um, it's, you know, it's free. There's paid functions inside it. Like there's a class, there's going to be other things that are within it that you pay to get access to, but the general thing is free. So how does that make money? <laughs> right. So one of the things that I did, like, this is me, my strategy that I'm still working out the bugs on for biz club is one of the biggest things that I think I did right with it is any of my social media presence, especially on Instagram is always focused on modeling behaviors that would later translate really well to a community. So I was already doing the community building on social media. So people were kind of primed. So what that that's like, that's the big goal, right? Use your social media almost like a testing grounds for community or a vetting grounds for members. So what that looked like for me, and it could look similar or different for you, is I made sure that my audience was correct first. And Deb does a lot of work with this for discovery. And before you've even launched a community, making sure that the audience is right. So maybe you're going to be launching a community that's about your services or your skills or a niche interest. If you already have a social presence that's adjacent to that, like if you have your, your business, right? So I have Bad X Enterprises is my main social media presence. If I have that, I use that as the testing grounds for Biz Club. Even though Biz Club is kind of its own thing, but under the Bad X umbrella, I didn't make a separate social media presence for it. I'm like, maybe someday I would, but right now I already have an audience with my existing social. Use that, test it, see what content resonates, start there, use it for market research. I am constantly messaging my like most active followers on Instagram or Facebook or emailing people I've worked with in the past and asking them, what do you need? What is your biggest struggle? What is making you super happy right now? What do you wish you had more of in your life as a business owner? You know, you tweak those questions and that research relevant to your industry and you have a free pool of data, which is what is going to make your community succeed. So after audience testing, another big thing that I use my social presence for is once I know the correct audience is showing up to my posts, I start playing with the content. So that's like, what do people respond to? Um, one thing I started doing a lot more of that I don't do on Instagram anymore because I do it all in my community is I started live streaming. People didn't necessarily always show up to the lives on Instagram or Facebook. A handful would. Time is hard because I have people that follow me from a bunch of different time zones, but the replays were really high value. People watched those. So that was, you know, an indication to me that like having the live still useful. The replay is really where it's at. And then getting people in the habit of interacting with me in a live platform or watching the recording, that format. I do that in the community now. Those people that were watching it on Instagram, I started trickling off of doing live streams on Instagram as much. I'll do one maybe once every other month, but not that frequently. And I was doing them weekly for a while kind of phase out of that and start redirecting to the community. That's where the live things are happening. If you liked those, they're here now. So that sort of modeling of content became really important. Um, and then my, my personal favorite thing was behavior modeling. So 
demonstrating what I want people to do within the community and seeing if they do it on my social. So it's really important to me that people be willing to comment, reply, talk, right? Like a community where I just post resources still would be somewhat useful, but I could do that on my website and save the fees for Mighty Networks and just put a bunch of downloadable stuff on my website. I want people to chat and make connections and get introduced to each other. I have a question Yeah. about that. Yeah, because I think, well, we see the value in that as community builders. Why is that important to you as a business owner for them to connect? Is there a thought around that? Yeah. (laughs) Um, Beyond just really enjoying, like as a person, I really enjoy connecting people to each other that will benefit. Like I like that that makes me feel good, that makes them feel good. But beyond that, it's, I mean, without sounding like callous or cold, it's goodwill factor. If I'm the one that brings these two people together that can support each other, that is still remembered as a beneficial experience. So like for you and I, for example, we only met because we both were involved with the Community Leaders Expo. I have a lot of goodwill towards that expo because I had a lot of really positive outcomes from it. You know, there are ways that you could easily focus on like the cost of that, right? Cost ticket, travel, time away from work, hotel, food, whatever else, right? You could list all the costs, but the benefits of the relationships I built at that two day event way outweigh any of those costs in the long run. And I've already seen return on that. So I know that that's a value provide for me. I can see how a relationship building experience gives me goodwill towards an entity, an event, a group, a person. If I'm involved in a networking group and nothing is coming from it, I don't have goodwill towards them. I'm not going to go back to that networking group. If it's, you know, a networking group put on by a chamber, let's say, like chamber of commerce, something like that. I join, I show up, nothing great happens. I'm like, what's the point of joining the chamber even, right? So same for biz club. If people show up to biz club, they get resources from me, which is great, but they're also connecting with each other. They're like, biz club is the place to be. I have so many opportunities because of this. And that is what makes it beyond just a resource center on your website. It's a living thing that people feel like they're benefiting from and also contributing to. Yeah, I think what's great about, we have this living journal in Find Calm Here community. And what I love about that is that uh, we can keep connected throughout time. And you can see my journey <laughs> over yeah. the last year since I launched, I did a, I started a year ago. And so now you can see like all the iterations and the changes and the journey. And so somebody new that's coming in, that's dropping into that space could literally see a timeline of Deb's experience <laughs> and then say, oh my God. And then I'm sharing what I've learned. Right. Yeah. And then she could be like, the person could be like, oh my goodness that's a good idea. Why didn't like, I'm glad that I read this so that I don't either make the same mistake or like learn something like a wisdom piece that like, now I know that I didn't have to go and research or find. So I think that's the benefit. Uh, Lee's question here was like, how does it benefit your business? I think was, was his question, but, um, I, I know the answer, but you, uh, you want to clarify that? Yeah, sure. So my company benefiting from the networking, Um, in two ways. So there's a specific instance I'm thinking of when I first launched Biz Club, there were people that I knew really well, right? Past clients, things like that, that joined. A couple people that I didn't know joined, which eventually, right? Like, which was cool and exciting. When those people joined, I started doing a little, what I call aggressive friend matchmaking. So I either the new people that I didn't know, I messaged them and I was like, tell me about you. Cause I have no idea who you are. Are you a robot? Um, they weren't and found out some about them and like what they were interested in, what they were struggling with, whatever their industry was adjacent to some of the people I already knew. I made sure that they connected. That was cool. That was great. 
the new person that just showed up after connecting the person I already knew talked about when like in private, like not like with me in the room, like they're having a chat. They talked about how beneficial my services or my skills were. The new person was voicing frustrations. The existing person suggested that the new person take my class. The existing person wasn't going to take it, right? Like they had already, they had a lot of that knowledge. They were looking for something beyond that. New person needed it. New person messages me, tell me about the class. That's $300. So that is me making a friend for somebody that has helped them with other stuff too. Like they're in adjacent industries located totally different parts of the country and they could chat about it, like not only their own needs, but ways I would fit that. I also have like, yeah, Lee posted in the chat, super fans talk and support your company. Yes. Giving people the tools, like resources to talk about my services and the things that I offer is really important. And that results in money, business, but also the goodwill, like the long-term goodwill. Cause I'm kind of in this pivoty stage of wanting to develop more on-demand content that people access through the community. And that's very different than what I'm currently doing, right? Mm -hmm. I do a lot of hands-on work. What's the shift for that? What do you um, feel like? It's time to do. I, I don't know. I don't have a, I don't have a good a, a reason. <laughs> Um, no, but uh, when you, uh, you know, I feel I'm resonating with a lot of what you're saying here in, in, in regards to, you know, figuring out what your bandwidth is, understanding yeah. what you're, what you really want to do and what lights you up versus what's draining to you. Those are key factors in identifying like the content creation aspect and things like that. And the other thing I'll go back to touch on is that you talked about how amazing it is when just because you truly want to be, uh, a connector to people in an authentic way. And that shows up because you show value and provide value for others. Then those people that are in the conversation in a room that you're not in now are talking about, oh my gosh, Carolyn is amazing uh, because X, Y, and Z. And then the other person is now subscribing. Oh, well, you're recommending her. It's like getting a really good yeah. recommendation. It's like when people talk about you, when you're not in a room and they're talking about the great things that you do, because you've, they've had this amazing experience. It just all goes back to relationship building. It's yep. the foundation of every single thing that we do as community leaders is we build relationships. And then the thing that I liked that you said was about, you got to know the members. And I think that's a lot of what people don't spend a whole lot of time on. They feel like um, it's a lot of work and therefore they maybe don't prioritize it or don't yep. even, some, in some cases, don't even try to reach out to members to like, besides, you know, telling them, you know, go to this resource, do this, yes. go here. And instead of saying, Hey, I really like to get to know you, but now that you got to know the person, then you could then authentically be like, Oh my gosh, you know, like Deb's a community builder. You should connect with Missy who does community building too, or whatever, like, mm -hmm. um, and then that relationship can blossom based on the fact that you knew those two people and how they could benefit each other in some way. And then in, in the business perspective, Carol had actually got a client from yeah. our group, <laughs> she's yeah. working with John Summers now. He was an app developer. I don't know what you would title his title as app software. developer, yeah, software, software developer, developer. Mm -hmm. who's, who's creating this amazing new tool for community builders. That's not even like available yet. Um, and you're helping and you're helping yeah. him with that. And that, yeah. that relationship was built on the fact that I decided to bring people together that are community consultants inside a collective that we meet virtually every month. And because I invited Carolyn and John to that space, they met and now she got a client. So that's just one example yes. of like this whole idea of like wanting to create collaboration instead of um, competition, offering a space and then shared value among the people in the room. I wanted to just mm -hmm. share that beautiful story because. Oh, and it's, it's awesome. And like some, you know, you kind of asked like, what is the reasoning for wanting to do more of the on-demand content? First of all, I mean, like I really see that my audience benefits from it. Um, doing live workshops, I love, I thrive off of, you know, a, a virtual or in-person room of people. 
a lot of business owners can't show up at a set time. So having something where they can take on their own pace, 2 a.m., 2 p.m., whenever they want, that is super important to my business still being able to function. Because I was doing a lot of like live workshops, no one was showing up, but then the recordings were really well viewed. And I'm just like, you know, get frustrated with it. But then you're like, okay, it's not about me and like my necessarily my favorite way to interact with people that will come. I'll have opportunities to do that. And I have, but really meeting people where they're at and providing for them is going to allow me to do more of the parts that I love. Right. So like the opportunity to work with John is something that had I not a been involved with your community and B started really actively thinking about who I want to work with, how I want to work with them and what my community can do to support that. Like being able to have, even though it's not like a ton of money yet, but having that income bringer of having a class set up that I can direct people to, if they're like, I'd love to consult with you. Like, okay, well first take the class and then let's talk. I love that. that. Like a pre-qualifier because yeah. as, as somebody who's struggling with business oh, yeah. over this last year, I can tell you it's incredibly hard to uh, to, to really validate or know that your time is going to be worth it. A lot of the yep. time when you get on these calls, you're like, you do, I mean, I do a bit of research to, to get to know who I'm going to oh, talk same. to before I get on a discovery call. But then at the end of the day, you don't know where that conversation is going to go. I've had people be like, you know, well, just tell me the answer. And I'm like, but you need to pay me for that. And that's yes. how this works. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I've definitely like, I mean, I have learned, over time of like using a vetting process, right. To determine who can work with me, <laughs> like, right. or who it's going to benefit. Right. Cause there's some people that th- our services, our values, we're not aligned. Like what I'm going to tell them, they won't listen to and just because not like they're a bad person. It's just, we shouldn't work together. And yeah. that's fine, but you know, it's different values yeah. or different needs or yeah. yeah. Missy has her hand up. What's up, yep. Missy? You got to unmute for us. I have two questions. Um, the first one is, um, so your five tips that yes. you mentioned in the title, is that a resource that you have an actual document for um, that we can access somewhere? Yeah, I'll have that for you. That'll probably be done later today. And this uh, will be, the podcast will be going live to re-listen to, but yes, the typed up audience content testing, mini community modeling behavior, those types of things I can type up as a resource that Deb can then share out in the Find Calm Here community. Great. That would be great. And then the other question I have is, so I love your concept of using your social media, your current social media as sort of a testing ground. Um, What are you finding or are you finding it challenging as the algorithms have moved more and more to showing what I find in social media feeds is I'm getting a lot of suggested content as opposed to the the communities and the people that I've set up to follow, I'm not actually getting those people. So how are you handling that? Or are you not? (laughs) Both. Um, So within Instagram, there's now a feature that you can go and you can see everyone you've followed. Um, It's the chronological feed has returned. If you go on to Instagram and you're in your main feed and you click on the Instagram word, it'll drop down. It'll say like home following favorites. Um, And it'll show you a chronological feed of everyone you're following. That is one way that I make sure that I'm seeing what other people are posting, but also that I'm interacting with them so that my content shows up. The other thing, I don't care. I really don't care if my social media performs well. Um, What I care at the end of the day is if a random stranger who has $80 million that they want to hand to somebody like me, if they show up on my Instagram, are they going to see posts that make them go, wow, it doesn't matter if they see it right after I posted it. 
My Instagram is my portfolio for my brand. My Facebook is the same way. My LinkedIn also. Like, If people see that content, are they getting a good idea of what I offer, who I am as a person, what I stand for, and my skills? And, you know, like my personality as well, because if they are not seeing that, if they're seeing something that doesn't represent me, we're both going to waste a lot of time. If I'm saying like, I'm a full stack coder and here's how to code an app, like that is false, first of all. Um, And if they're looking for that and we spend some time chatting and they realize I'm not that, that's a bummer for us both, right? They've wasted time finding the right person. So I use it. It's like an extension of a business card. It's you've met somebody, you say, check out my Instagram, or they remember your business name and they look it up. They're on your website, they're on your social. They should just be seeing a really great gallery of who you are and what you do. The amount of people who like it, comment on it, doesn't necessarily matter to me as much. Obviously, you want more eyes on it, but if you don't get it, it only takes one set of eyes or maybe even one eye to be (laughs) the right person, right? Exactly. You know, it just takes one. It just takes showing up to the right person once to totally transform your whole business. So if you remember that, that helps a ton. Yeah. Yeah. I I really like that description, uh, having your social media be a, like a portfolio for your brand. That's a really concise, helpful way to describe it. Thank you. Yeah. And it, it takes pressure off of you, right? For content creation, you basically just go back to that question. If somebody who has a ton of money and wants to hire somebody like me or wants my product, let me think, is this post going to help convince them in some way? Yep. Just you, I see lots of people. It seems like it's resonating with, yeah, it takes pressure off content creation. Cause you're like, you can look at it. You can be like, okay, well, jumping on this trend help. Yeah. You might get a reel to go viral. If the person who is your most idealist, bestest, perfectest client ever sees it, is that trending real going to help you? Like maybe it makes you more human, more relatable, but like, does it provide value? Yeah. So one of the things that I loved, I want to point in one of the things that I love that you said during the mindful marketing session was about longevity and time commitment to platforms that offer longevity. So when we say that, explain to everybody what that means for us. (laughs) So this is also, I mean, if you want (laughs) to join in the fun journey of seeing me do this and take my own advice in real time and struggle and fail and have success and get frustrated with um, platforms that promote the long life of your content are better use of your time, right? So What platform, if anybody wants to type in chat, what platform, social media, do you think gives your content? You make a piece of content on this platform. How long are people going to see it or discover it? I'll give you guys a couple seconds to answer. Joanne was like right on it. She's like immediately had it typed up. She's like Pinterest. (laughs) And it's funny because I just met a Pinterest uh, VA and uh, was blown away by the amount of people on Pinterest because I haven't been on Pinterest, honestly, for like, I want to say five or six years because I did it when I was like in my photography business. But then when I, when I transitioned to tech sales and then now in this, I just, it wasn't in there, but yeah, it's a, She's right on the Pinterest uh, thing there. Um, yeah. Lisa's not Facebook. Christy not, says LinkedIn. Not Facebook. Nope. LinkedIn, not really. I mean, when you think about how content even looks on the platform, right? It's getting covered, right? It's like layers of rock. You can get back down. Like You can go find the fossils at the bottom. We do that. Paleontologists do that. Like, that's a thing. But if, like, the best stuff was right at the surface... It's a little more useful and it lives a little bit longer. Like people see it more, right? So Pinterest is a search engine. It's not a social media platform and it performs the best for length of content. The one that is better is YouTube. So unfortunate for everyone who hates video, it's the best platform. If you're making content and it's video content and you're putting any amount of effort into it, YouTube is 
the one that's going to give you the most length of time for your content existing. YouTube is also a really great place to build community. People keep coming back for your content once they start interacting with it. It's got a lot of potential. I mean, like we probably all have a content creator that we follow on YouTube, whether we've actually subscribed or not, but you know, we watch their videos. We're interested in their journey. We're curious what they have to say. I have like, I mean, yarn YouTubers, podcasters, I'm a car nerd. There's a bunch of like car restoration ones I follow and it's owned by Google. Yes, Ani, excellent point. It's owned by Google. So, you know, it's search engine works really good. Um, optimizing your content for YouTube takes a little bit of time to learn. Um, and it's can be frustrating. I kind of decided this year, I'm like, I love making videos and I know that I should be on YouTube. So this year I'm like, it's, I'm just doing it. I'm just going to do it. So this year I've been really dedicating a lot more time and content bandwidth to actually developing a YouTube presence. And so far, so good, slow. It, like it's a long haul. Like uh, Joanne said, uh, hit 20 subscribers and have some work to do to get there, right? It, to monetize, it takes thousand subscribers and 4,000 watch hours on YouTube, but who cares about monetization if they're going to your community and buying your stuff? Like those 20 people making a purchase within your community or on your website or hiring you, I have to keep reminding myself that because I really do want monetization, <laughs> but also like, you know, I, I, I think it's a good point to say that we tend to like, think about the monetization aspect first, yes. but we don't realize that you don't there's other it. way, there's other ways to monetize a YouTube channel, yep. like the one you just demonstrated. There's other ways to monetize a podcast than having sponsors. I okay. had a client that listened to a podcast and then hired me for a $4,000 project. That means I monetize my podcast. I had somebody explain this to me and I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. I get it now. Um, Adi has a question. So I want to yeah. pop over to Adi. So my question is more since we're talking about the YouTube, um, I used to use TubeBuddy mm -hmm. to help yeah. me, but I canceled that and I just got Morning Fame. Okay. And I wanted to see if you're familiar with it because even though I was told it takes a little time to for the keyword searching, but yeah. in the last two days, I'm ready to throw my computer against the wall oh, no. because it's frustrating. I'm not yeah. getting the letters. If you're familiar with Morning Fame, what it should be to move right. forward to set up the description of videos. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted to um, ask if you're familiar with it, if there's any tricks and tips so my computer can survive. I don't want you to wreck your computer. Um, so I use neither. I've watched a lot of demos of both. Um, I understand how they work functionally. For me, I'm, I'm maybe not the best one to ask for advice on this because it's this is within my skill set. Doing SEO, writing really strong keyword rich descriptions, developing titles like that is what I do for clients all the time. So figuring out how to optimize it on YouTube really wasn't that steep of a learning curve for me. Figuring out like what words are going to work for my audience is still taking time, but I'm like, I know, max out characters, make sure every description is, you know, has this formula. Um, one thing that I would suggest, and you can kind of see, I will um, drop my YouTube channel, you can see I have an auto-populated half of the description because for YouTube videos, you have 5,000 characters. That's so many. So I have a huge chunk that's like, here's my community. Here's my Instagram. Here's buy my ebook. Here's this, here's that, here's that, here's that, here's that. Like all of these things that are on every single video, as well as like a link back to my channel, a link to my website. Like billions of links because on most social platforms you can what post one link i mean facebook you can do several but i'm going to take advantage of that i think it's really really useful so for me i don't use any of those optimization tools because some of them aren't really built to necessarily assist with like the call to action side right they're built like 
how do you get eyeballs on this? I'm like, okay, but I, as a marketer and chronic overthinker, I'm like, what's the next step? Somebody watches it. What are they doing next? And I'm the one who has to figure that out. So that was, that was kind of my fifth tip for today. So excellent. Thank you for segueing that. The fifth tip that I had for today after modeling behavior is map the journey for your customers. So know when they're interacting with your social content, what have they done immediately before and what should they do immediately after? So for me, a lot of times I've met someone in person and then they're on my social or virtually I've met someone and then they're on my social. So they maybe have had an interaction with me. For my YouTube, I have likely never met them. They they know nothing about me. So what do they need to do next? They need to either watch more videos, join the community, or get to know me on social media more. If somebody's on my email list, what did they do before? They probably worked with me. They maybe were on my social media for a long time. They do not need to be going back to my social media. My call to action in an email should never be follow me on social. That is a step backwards. So knowing at what point people are interacting with your content that you're creating on their journey, right? Like you always kind of want to be moving people towards a level of more intimacy with you. Even if they cap out somewhere and they're like, okay, I can never pay her. I, I'm never going to hire her, but I want these resources. They've capped out. They shouldn't move backwards. So I hope that kind of makes sense with, especially with YouTube, right? When people are seeing those videos, what have they likely done before? That informs my descriptions, my titles, everything more than, you know, what's the best thing on YouTube that I can do like strategy wise. It's kind of like taking the strategy and twisting it to your own devices. Way to lens through which to look because it really is more intentional on the way we talk about marketing and how we, you and I, Carolyn, have talked about this in the past of like, just wanting to be more intentional about how we spend our time, making it more meaningful and impactful. And then how to, what does that look like? And I think while YouTube is the long game, it's not an instant, you know, you're not going to, and you don't need to spend a lot of time on this I feel like it's just you just need to start and one of the things I I did was like I just started uh, in 2020 and I just started doing these videos and I was doing all of these workshops and I was really on social media a lot and I got a you know I think I got like 40 something subscribers like randomly without even really trying but then you know like my mission changed and my focus changed and then uh, you know I was like well, I don't want to spend another time, time building a whole another YouTube channel. Yeah. Um, and I even bought a course last year, which I, I went through like two sessions and then haven't finished about like how to have a successful YouTube channel. When I realized I don't really want to have a YouTube channel, Right. But the more I think about it and realize I don't have to like stop everything I'm doing and like spend 10, 10,000 hours, you know, making my YouTube channel amazing. It's like Mm -hmm. more the incremental investment of time. Yep. Uh, so one hour a week, you know, 15 minutes, every three days, whatever the time is that I want to decide to commit to that. It's more about just structuring my time in a way that, okay, I'll just make sure that I, you know, upload a video after we've aired, you know, after we've done the recording. So Mm -hmm. it's there and, and then, you know, going back to, to just building more habits around it. So it's not so overwhelming of right I mean you can look at somebody who has been on YouTube since the beginning you can look at the the John and Hank Greens of YouTube and see like how far advanced they are and the the volume of content they put out I'm like they have a whole team yeah you know like comparing that it's unfair and it you know like that's great to have trajectory towards if that's the way you want to go but just starting. Yeah. is important. Okay. Christy asked a question. Stop comparing yourself to people who have like a team of social media marketing experts because you're doing just fine. All of you. (laughs) Yeah. Everybody amazing. 20 amazing followers. 
Yeah. It's, I always think about it too, like this, right? Like sometimes you can get really down about like, okay, that had like five views or zero. I've had my last two videos have had two. And I think one of them was me um, on another account. So I, and I've had ones that have gone really well and it's frustrating when it's like, okay, well, this content I know has value. That's all that matters. It doesn't matter who views it. Eventually it's going to work. So <laughs> looking at it from that lens of like the, again, like using it as a portfolio, it's also a time saver for me. If I talk about a topic and somebody comes into the community and I already have been doing this and they're like, I don't know if I have the right audience. Well, guess what? Carolyn in the past made a five minute YouTube video talking about that. You can watch it watch that. That's great. And let's talk in more depth if you still have questions, which you will, because it's a short video and that's an endless topic. But having it as a resource for community members has been really helpful. Yeah. Potential clients. Yeah. Lee's, okay. Lee was asking that question about creating content. Um, Lee, did you want to ask to just clarify? I didn't know if you wanted to ask or if you just wanted me to ask it. You mean the last thing I just put out there? Well, I, I was just commenting. It looked like uh, that Carolyn was taking her social media and her YouTube stuff and creating a, a path of, of your own funnel to, to finally get to a point where you're having social interaction, with, which is yes. kind of cool. Yep. Yeah. And I mean, sometimes it's, sometimes it's reverse. It goes from social interaction into it, but yeah, like for me, it's super important to know the journey that my clients are taking because mm -hmm. how can I serve them if I don't know what they've already seen? And like, I, I, I'm not, I wasn't thinking about that. And I see a lot of people that send me emails all the time that say, this is my social page. This is my, you know, and I'll, and yeah. I'll go on, you know, what, if, the, if somehow they know you, they're emailing you, they right. must know you're socially, right? So yeah. And it's, I'm not saying you can't put your social links in emails, but that shouldn't be your major call to action. Yeah. Right. But yeah, like knowing where people are on the path. Like if I were to, you know, email somebody I've worked with for years and be like, you might not know what bad acts is like, no, they know exactly what it is that that's really almost like bad, 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 bad customer service at that point. Like, you know, put your marketing in the right direction. Um, Christy asked a really good question. Uh, currently using social media, specifically LinkedIn as the top of the funnel, um, have a personal page and a business page. Should I be focusing my attention on both or just my personal page where I have over a thousand followers? Um, I personally do both, right? So Bad Axe still posts the content that I plan out. Carolyn shares it. I get way more interactions when Carolyn shares it, um, but bad, it's coming from Bad Axe. I always want to show like it's coming from that. That protects me in the future as well, because if I suddenly have a knitting pattern that goes completely viral and I make $2 million off of it in one night, I am going to be like, that was fun being a marketer. I'm going to go roll around in yarn for the rest of my life um, and hope that I can design something that goes viral again. But Carolyn can still exist. Bad acts as a business is separate from me as a human. And me as a human loves bad acts and I share it frequently and I talk about it and I get more relationships and interactions that way. But the content is always coming from the business side and having zero impressions, even though there's a lot of followers. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. link, LinkedIn's a weird world, but yeah, always like kind of giving yourself the freedom to exist and to pivot. It's another thing too with like um, Facebook, right? Because you have your personal persona and your business. I have business owners that'll ask me like, how often should I share it to my personal page? That's up to you. Um, it's, you know, it's, we are a whole human. We're interacting in everything. You don't just like shut off part of you, but online you need to protect yourself in a way that like you're not, putting yourself in a place where you are your brand entirely, even if you are, even if it's just you, you need to have that layer of protection that you can be like, maybe Carolyn doesn't want to talk about bad acts today. Maybe we're in a fight you know, maybe we're frustrated and bad acts can just post its stuff. I don't have to do it. Oh, I love 
that maybe we're, <laughs> I feel like that with fine comb here sometimes. I'm I mean, like, I like be upset with fine comb here, but right. I could be. <laughs> well, and like, I, you know, I personify, that's an easy way to figure out like your brand voice is to like personify it. Right. And like, think about like, okay, what is bad acts? Like it is me at the end of the day, it's always me, but it's also its own thing. Like I could conceivably remove myself from it. It would yeah. probably not work, but. I yeah. also have, I want to have also a comment and Christy asked about, yes, I do this too. So I post on, we use buffer for our social media scheduling. So we schedule things out on buffer and then it goes out to our Twitter, uh, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Facebook pages of my business for, for the Fine Calm Hair brand. And then I go in to LinkedIn and then, and I've specifically changed my strategy around this. I only focus really on LinkedIn. I don't do it much on Facebook. I used to do it more on Facebook, but now I've switched to LinkedIn. So I, I, I then I go over to my, my I go to share it and then I share it on my personal page. And then on top of that, I try to tag some people so that they like to bring their attention to it because then that ends up getting more views. And one of the things I recently did, and I think it's a, it's a matter of context, right? So I wanted to ask a question to try to get feedback from people for my book that I'm writing. So I actually shared a question as Deb, because I had authentically had a question about a book I'm writing, but then like I have content where I want to drive people to either read my blog post or listen to a podcast or whatever. And so then I would share it as fine calm here and then Deb would share it. Right. So there's different practices for different things. And I also have, um, I re I, I keep going back and forth about, should I have, um, different aspects of my life on LinkedIn? For example, I went to school for journalism. I have a background in, in a photography and photojournalistic degree and experience there. I won three Keystone Awards that nobody really cares about anymore. <laughs> but like I, I had a really successful career as a, as a journalist for a while. Then I went to tech sales and did tech sales. Then I became a uh, artist and I had over um, 20 uh, exhibits of my photographic artwork. And then I did commission sales for hotels. And then on top of that, I was in tech sales. And then on top of that, I launched a business in 2020 called Find Calm Here. So Deb is very layered <laughs> of a person. And Thanks. there was, there was, and I think most people are like that, yeah. but it's like, we've, I, I had this block around it of like, okay, I can't show Deb. Everybody has to know Deb as the person who's a community builder now. We can't talk about Deb, who was the photojournalist 10 mm -hmm. years ago, 20 years ago. And now I've really shifted that opinion and perspective to be like, no, this is Deb is Deb like over time. It's not like yeah. I like transitioned into a whole nother human being. I'm still like with my experience. And in fact, that brings the layers of my experience into my business. So now I started a business page for my photography business, just to say that, Hey, I'm still doing photography. And some people in my LinkedIn really loved my photography. And now you can guess what? You can still follow my photography because I still do photography. I just don't do it as a specific business anymore. Right. So yeah. I think that's a good point to say that there's multi layers of us that we have, and I think it's okay to share. And then just putting people in the pockets where they will like people put you in the pocket where you belong. So if there's certain people that just remember me as a photographer or a writer, or there's certain people that remember me as the tech salesperson. So that's okay. But I'm multifaceted in those aspects. Sorry. I just went on a yeah. tangent. No. And that, like, I mean, that, as service providers, that's like a huge benefit. Like, I don't know how many times I've been able to actually like really relate with a retailer. Cause I did a startup like for a year, I ran a yarn shop, like a brick and mortar yarn shop with a friend from high school. And it was awesome. Great experience, but that, you know, not every marketer has started up a yarn shop or run a business besides a marketing business. So it gives you a perspective on like what the day-to-day -day is, what it's like to be on the other side of that. Um, I know we only have like three minutes left, but yeah. Joanne yeah. asked what my thoughts about TikTok were. And I love TikTok. <laughs> I really do. Um, I hated it for so long. The technology is absolutely terrifying and it's really, really bad for your mental health. Um, it's a super addictive platform. You have to set timers. Um, I it's currently deleted off my phone. Um, cause I went for like my typical self of like a three week spree of being really active there. 
I have two TikTok accounts. I have one, well, three, technically. I have three TikTok accounts, one for my fiber artistry that's recently started. Like I recently started that one because I was already making reels on Instagram for that stuff. So I was like, that's silly. I should also use them on TikTok. Um, and there's a big fiber arts community there. One for bad acts, which I don't really use that much. Um, and then one for my kind of like personal, right? Like I made the personal one first that I used to explore the platform. Cause I'm like, people were asking me about it. I didn't have an account. I was like, I need to know what's happening here. It's my job. <laughs> so I made it. I really like it. I really think that there's a lot of potential there. If you're already making videos, if you hate videos and they make you upset, don't get a TikTok um, and don't try to force it. It can be a lot of fun. It can be a really lighthearted, interesting, cool place. The way mathematically that it works and shows you content, I find fascinating. Like just how like people joke, it's like, oh yeah, TikTok diagnosed me with, you know, whatever of like behavioral disorders and things like that. But it really can figure out what you're into without, with very minimum input from you, which is because of face recognition software, which is fine. The robots own everything. We we're all trapped now. Skynet. It's fine. That's uplifting. Um, but yes, I, I think it's an interesting platform, but don't add a new platform. If you're not ready to make the content for it, don't start a YouTube. If you hate recording videos, don't get a TikTok If you hate it, if you want to check it out and see what it's like, go for it. Make make an account. You don't have to make it a big thing. Just check it out. See, set timers, delete it from your phone. Yeah, it sucks you in. Um, does anybody have any final questions? Anything else we can chat for a second before we all turn into pumpkins? <laughs> But that was great conversations. There's so many good questions and social media is the one thing that, you know, we think as business owners, we have to be doing, we have to be really active and we have to build this gigantic audience. And while that can be helpful to, to get people to know you like on a wide audience level, we also have to be really concerned about our own personal needs and yeah. putting those first. So I am the, the, the really, <laughs> the person that has been spent a lot of time and energy creating lots of content because I honestly wanted and enjoy doing it. But at the same time, like it's sacrificing my mental and physical health, which now I'm like, okay, need to like put the brakes on a million things and really get direct and focused on what's going to really bring me the return on investment for the business when I'm working on my business and then giving me enough time that I can walk away and say, okay, Deb's going camping this weekend and we're going to yes. have a, a away from my computer weekend and that's going to be fantastic. Um, so yeah, so thank you so much. Uh, you said, thanks. Yeah, you are thank welcome, you. Lee. I'm so glad you joined. Um, and, and Mark uh, had to leave, but I'm so glad he joined too. He has a lot of amazing um, community content. And he actually gave me a tip on his uh, mastermind call the other week about um, connecting with people. So LinkedIn there's been a lot of like conversations around promotion of like cold, you know, like cold reach out and like, these, yeah. And, and you talked, you touched on it a little bit ago about how, um, if people don't like, if people know you and then you get this, like I, this happened to me recently, I know this yes. person really, really well. And I've been in many meetings and sessions with her and marketing. Anyway, I know her. And then I got these automated messages in LinkedIn from her. And I'm just like, <sighs> what? <laughs> like, no is automatically was like turning me off, even though I love this person as a friend. Right. Yep. And I, I, I reached out to her and I said, look, I don't know that I know this isn't you. I know that it's like a system that you've created somehow. And if that's helpful, that's it's working then, you know, whatever, but to me, it's not feeling good. So I would recommend not doing this kind of outreach to people. Um, but I really, I really um, think it depends on, you know, what you're comfortable with. And the key here is knowing yourself. I think the biggest takeaway I've found like from today was just like, do what feels right and what lights you up and what you get, what you want to do, not what people say you should do. <laughs> yep. Yeah. And like, again, 
your brain it's your biggest asset you melt your brain you have nothing left to run your yeah. business with like yeah. keep keep that protected at all oh, times. I got distracted. So my thought was that Mark was telling me instead of having cold, cold reach outs to do, uh, I, I usually meet people on a virtual call like this. I build a relationship with somebody either in a chat or when we're talking on a video call, I reach out to them at the same time, like when we're in the session or right after the session on LinkedIn and say, Hey, it was so great to chat with you or to listen to you during this last blah, 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 whatever it was. Um, and then when they accept my connection, what he recommended doing to build business relationships was to send a video or a voice note yep. and, yep. Uh, and just say, Hey, Mark, I'm so glad you joined today. I really look forward to talking with you again. Uh, let me know if you'd love to chat some more or whatever the message is. And yep. I did that. I did 20 of them in one day I put, cause I don't like video at all, mm. <laughs> at all. And I did 20 of them in one day and I got about five or seven people responding to me with really positive thoughts of like, Deb, that was so, cause I said really nice things to them because, and it was virtual, you know, it was like authentic. I said things that I meant, but I just said positive things to them. Like, thanks for showing up in this amazing time or in the session. And I had people messaging me back being like, oh, Deb, thank you. That was like, that just made my day. Yeah. And, and you know, whether that goes to a client work or whether that relationship grows or not, I just know that I, you know, somebody said I've like cheered up their day. I mean, that's a pretty cool good feeling. If, yeah. if nothing else, that's pretty cool. But I did get one person reply back and be like, Deb, you just reminded me that I need to do this for my own business. <laughs> Mm -hmm. He goes, you, you can't, and he's a pretty big name person. He goes, and I met him at PodFest. He goes, you can't even imagine how many people are cold DMing me, you know, all the time. Yeah. And he goes, you're like one of the only people in the last, you know, whatever time frame that has sent me this like personalized message and a video message. And so kudos to you for doing that one. And now wow. you've like passed the t baton on to me to be you like, gotta, I need you got to step up. Yeah. <laughs> which is crazy, which is somebody like he was talking about, you know, working with people like Gary Vaynerchuk. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just right. like, okay. <laughs> so anyway, thank you all for being here. I'm super um, so glad that you could join us again. Um, continue the conversation in the uh, Find Calm Here community. I'd love for Carolyn, if you could share your resource yep, in the Find Calm Here community for people um, so that they can like dig into that. You can create an article or just if it's yes. a PDF, whatever it is, just uh, throw it in the Find Calm Here community and, and they can all grab it there. Um, for everybody who is listening to this recording on the podcast, uh, if you're interested in joining our sessions, all you need to do is send me an email at deb at findcomhere.com and I will uh, definitely would love to have you join our conversations. We are doing more live interviews. We do have two coming up in August and uh, the ones in August, we've got one, Lisa, could you remind me of what the, what the uh, podcast live interviews that are coming up in August are? I know now I put her on the spot. Okay. <laughs> no, totally fine. Let me just pull it up right here. Um, we have coming up leading a global mindfulness community and um, that's with Elijah. Yep. Yep. That's yep. the end of the month. And then we have, Oh, um, building a community with strengths, right? Mm -hmm. What's that on? What's that day on? That's the 12th. Um, I have, <laughs> okay. I'll put I, I have on here. I have the dates that they go live. Um, not that oh, they're live, but the, that they get published. <laughs> you're looking at our, our, our private Trello board and that, that's cool. Um, so, but for any, for reference future, go to find calm here, go to the blog, all of the blog posts, um, our events are listed under there. And so going, starting in August, we are going to be having live events every other Friday. Um, so that'll be our consistent, like kind of come and connect with us. Uh, when you're inside the Find Calm Here community. So I just want to point that out. And uh, thank you so much for everybody who has uh, shared and connected and uh, reached out to us today. Uh, if you want to get a hold of Carolyn, Carolyn, where can people find you if they're super excited? 
to talk with um, you? I think one of the best ways, I mean, you can message me on any social platform. I see I got some requests on LinkedIn. That's awesome. I'll be approving those and messaging you guys back later today. Biz Club is free to join if you want to talk more mindful marketing. I can throw that link in here again. That is another really great way to interact with me directly. Uh, one second. Yeah. Um, and your community is free, right? Am I right? Yeah. Free to yeah. join. The paid features are classes. I'm working on a 30 day challenge that'll be self paced as well that you pay a little bit to join. And there's prizes and fun stuff like that. So, yeah. Biz Club. That's a really great way to interact with me, meet some other people, stuff like that. Thank you. Thanks Thank so much you. for sharing. Um, and yeah, super excited to have you uh, coming up. Like I said, Fridays are going to be every other Friday are our live workshops. Uh, August, our uh, theme for August is community structure. So we're going to be talking about what does that mean? Meaning uh, what are examples of community structures? Uh, examples are uh, a challenge, which Carolyn just mentioned, a course is another one, a live course is a different one, and many other community structures. So if you have questions, bring them to our sessions in August, because we're going to be talking all about community structures posted in the, the Find Calm Here community, your questions, um, share what your structure is and what you really love about it, what's working. Uh, if you've got like a monthly event that people really show up to, um, let us know. Like, I'd love to hear more about what's working with you. And so that's what we're going to talk about with Elijah. He launched a, a, um, a daily dose, uh, mindfulness, uh, community bonus, um, twice a day, uh, with, with instructors that has turned out to be really a uh, positive experience for his community, which has over 8,000 people, probably 9,000 people at this point. And then, um, the other person we're going to talk to is Allegra, who is uh, an expert with, with uh, UMAP, which is a uh, certification and assessment program to better identify your strengths so that you can really focus on leading your business or your um, community with your strengths. So uh, those will be coming up. And until the next time, I hope you are finding calm in this day, evening, afternoon, morning, Wednesday at one, Enjoy your day. Have fun until the next time. Take care and uh, we'll see you later. Have a great day. Bye.